a discussion of lymphomacy in theories that we uh, were undertaking last class. Um, you remember we, we discovered that the operator product expansion uh, was the wrong
that we have to insert into. So if you had a path integral with an operator O inserted and the original set variables, then once you make the, uh, the, the transformation to uh, the z prime variables, you were, are supposed to insert the operator O tilde. Okay? When O tilde was equal to O plus L. Okay? So we have O tilde of Z, uh, but since this is Z prime, that's called Z prime, is O of Z prime plus delta O of Z prime. This is the insertion that we have to make in the Z prime variables if we want to get the same result as the path integral with O inserted in the Z variables. Okay? But let's expand this out. So this is O tilde of Z prime is equal to O of Z prime plus H epsilon uh, epsilon prime of Z O plus epsilon of Z delta. Now these two guys can be combined into that O tilde of Z prime is equal to O of Z. Remember that Z was simply Z prime plus epsilon Z prime. Okay? So this is just the first term in the Taylor expansion of that statement. Okay? So this part of the transformation is very simple. It's just telling you that the insertion that was at the point Z in one variable, uh, if, you, if you make an insertion at a given point, you know, point with a given value, let's say one, in the first set of variables, the same insertion has moved to points with different values in the second set of variables because the variables are different. That's what this part is saying. It is very easy comes. This part can also be promoted to a finite expression which has uh, this term as its first Taylor series expansion. It's simply uh, del of z divided by del of z prime to the power. Okay? Uh, you see that Z was Z prime plus epsilon Z prime. Uh, so if you expand this up, this is just 1 plus epsilon Z prime, and then to the power H gives you the factor of H. Okay. So this is 1 plus epsilon prime. Okay. Expand it up, that's the power H. Okay. Yeah, to put everything in Z prime. Is this here? Now I'm going to leave it as an exercise. So this is a finite form of the transformation. Okay? That will reduce to this infinitesimal transformation for infinitesimal epsilon. Okay? And I'm going to leave it as an exercise for you to convince yourself that you can get to this finite form by integrating infinitesimals. Okay? So uh, if you had an operator such that the uh, uh, operator product expansion of the stress tensor with the operator well, had just these two similar pieces, the one by z square piece and the one by z piece, then that tension to that operator transforms in a very simple way under conformal transformations. And we found that conformal transformation, we found that, that simple transformation, the way Kulchinsky writes to write with us dz prime by dz to the power h, or till the z prime to the power h. Okay. So this is how operator okay. operators that have this simple transformation property under the stress tensor are called primary operators. Okay? Why they call the, this primary prime this operator product expansion uh, would map to some nice property of representation theory of this uh, uh, well, this operator product expansion will imply that the state dual to this operator, what that means we'll come to in a minute, uh, we'll come to very soon, and that the state dual to this operator is at the bottom of a tower of its, its representation under the Wheeler's algebra. What well, the Wheeler's algebra is, we'll also come to in a minute. So, I, I should have said this, but anyway. We we'll see that, the, that this, this form of the operator product expansion um, implies that operators of this sort they special, have a special role to play in representation theory. Okay. That's basically the reason they call it primary. 
the primary or low state objects. Okay, but at the moment, it's definition. Okay. Now, we see that the stress tensor is not itself a primary object. Because it's operator product expansion to the stress tensor, while it has these two pieces also in addition, but unless C is zero, unless C is zero, the stress tensor also in addition has this effect, this is here. Okay? Now, what does that imply for the transformation? What does that imply for the transformation of the stress tensor under the form? Okay? So, now suppose you perform an infinitesimal conformal transformation on the stress tensor itself. Okay, uh, it's just a uh, clarification of the definitions. Yes. So, what is the difference between a primary and a quasi-primary? Okay, a quasi-primary operator is an operator that has definite weights under scaling dimension and scaling. Okay? And scaling. So, any operator that has a definite value of h in each power. Okay? Uh, it's called quasi-primary. For an operator to be quasi primary, all that is required is that its operator product expansion with the stress tensor has this form as far as 1 by z squared and 1 by z turns We saw last time that that was the same statement as having definite transformation properties under, uh, under spin and scaling dimension. A quasi primary operator could, in addition, have other additional singularities in its operator product expansion. Okay? A primary operator has no further, no additional. So the D will be a quasi -primary. It would be a quasi primary. Okay. So now the question we're asking is what is the transformation problem? How does T itself transform under conformal transformations? Okay, so let's uh, work this out in here. Well, work this out in the What we want is the uh, is the uh, uh, is the recipe of the pole in this expression. Well, of course, these two parts. Survive. So t tilde of z prime is equal to, uh, it has these two pieces in it. So it's 2 epsilon prime z t plus epsilon z uh, del t. But there's an additional piece. The additional piece comes from taking this epsilon and differentiating three times. Okay? So that would give us an epsilon triple prime of zero divided by six from the Taylor expansion. That would also give us a z cube. The z cube will cancel against the z to the four here to give us a pole. And then we will have the c by two. Oh, I put c by twelve and c by two. And then we will have the c by two, so we get c by twelve. That's epsilon triple prime of zero. Okay? Yeah, and then of course that was the original. Okay. Now, you say that this piece is conceptually different from this piece. Say so, because... Yeah, wait. Is it It's expired. Oh, well, I've, I've inserted the second z, uh, uh, second uh, t at zero. If I insert that w, it would be epsilon triple prime at w. You see, because what we're doing is taking epsilon, let's look at this for okay. I've taken t of z o of 0, so the, the analog of that is t of z t of 0. I want now the pole in z of this expression. Okay? So, what I want to do is to ex expand epsilon in a power series expansion in z. So, okay, so we will just multiply this by epsilon and I want the pole of epsilon by z minus w to the power of 4. Exactly. There's no W. We will put the okay. element zero. Okay, so we, we multiply it by epsilon, and we want the pole of that expression when we divide by z to the form. So no, if you if you want to cancel, so we've got a singularity at of z to the form. If you want to cancel that, you have to do Taylor series expansion in of epsilon of zero. Yeah, that should be epsilon prime of zero. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. This was everything was. Well, I, I could do it better by just putting this thing in W. Okay? Suppose, uh, let, I could, let me tell you. Uh, okay. Suppose I put this in W. I put everything in W. Everything will be W. Okay? Now let's put everything in W. Then, this, this everything here is W. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
Should I try to clear up everything here? Maybe I should. Okay. So everything here would be W prime and, and W. So this O of W prime is equal to O of W. And it's just a switch Z goes to W. Okay. The same, the, the, the transformation between the prime and non prime variables is the same, it depends on what name you use. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I'll just, this final answer since W is a W variable, it's the same. I won't, won't change that. And this is all it's in It's all in there. What, 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 what? The last thing, yes? Uh, okay. If it hits over Z square, you know, even if there's a rotation? This, you're asking about the opening, T of Z, T of W is always H, but O, let's say O of W, O of W divided by Z minus W. This is always true. It holds for every value of W, in particular W equals C. Yeah, so there's no problem in putting W equals zero. It just sometimes obscures things. But it's not wrong. Because this works for any two points in W. In particular W. Okay, is this clear? I Sorry about all of that, but, but okay. Um, this notation has been terrible, but I should really do is to clean it out and like, rewrite the in new notation. But you can understand what I've done, right? You know, the logic is clear, so you can fill out the notation. Okay, now I want, I want you to look at uh, this transformation piece and notice that it's logically different. Uh, I mean, there's a big difference between this piece and these pieces. Because this piece, these pieces are all homogeneous in the stress. All of them, degree 1 in the stress test. Well, this piece is degree 0 in the stress test. So you see, the what's happening here is that this additional piece, because it's not proportional to the stress test itself, it's just picking up, uh, telling you that you pick up, when you do a, a component transformation, in addition to what you would have got, in addition to the transformation that you would have got, had T been a quasi prime, had T been a completely primary operator, okay, what you get is an additional constant. Okay, so T shows by something that's proportional to T plus a constant. Oh, so this is the variation of T under the uh, under the top transformations. Okay, this one is very uh, unusual in the sense that the initial factor with the T equal to zero. Right. Then you know you do a control transformation and you find it with you have a high T. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I'll give you a physical interpretation of this in one particular case in a moment. Uh, it's basically the, the physical interpretation will be the vacuum identity. You see, since it corresponds or contributes only to a constant, it contributes only to the zero. Okay? So this basically is telling you that uh, the, the vac zero mode of T is a vacuum identity. When acting on a vacuum, it's a vacuum identity. Okay? So this basically is telling you that, that a conformal transformation can change the vacuum energy. Okay? But this is a very familiar fact. Because vacuum energy has a Casimir part. So the, the in a conformal field, in any quantum field. Yeah. But, but the, we, I mean, we have not put anywhere that you know, like, we are working in a finite... Uh, well, it could be. We'll, we'll see in a moment. You know, an example of this, of such a conformal transformation, where we want the texture of the from the cylinder to the plane. Okay? So it takes you from working in a finite space to an infinite space. So in the infinite space you have no gas energy. In the finite space you do have gas energy. So there should be a slip in vacuum energy. Okay? 
That will be the physical interpretation of this effect when we see it. But let's hang on to see the, uh, see the examples. No, but it's true, it sounds, sounds funny and puzzling. And the key point is that, you know, uh, well, it has to do with the fact that to get the energy, energies are generally infinite. To get them right, you have to perform a subtraction. Now, subtraction has to be local. So if you, put, you set it a zero in one space, it becomes something finite in that space. That's essentially what's going on. So just answer the energy. That's right. Okay, but it's, it's correct and it's physical. Okay, now, once again, I'm going to leave as an exercise for you people. I think we should make actually a list of exercises. Um, okay, so let me promise that by next class I'll give you a set of seven, eight problems to solve. Once again, I'll leave as an exercise for you people. Uh, and it's not an entirely trivial exercise as far as I know. I, I'm not terribly sure because I don't think I've ever worked it out. You guys will, no uh, To integrate this to a finite exercise. Again, yeah, you know how it you, you know how it ch changes the infinitesimally. Now you have to work it out a finite expression. Uh, the, the final answer is given in in Pochinsky's book. It's given in terms of a Schwarzschild method. Let me show. Okay, the final answer is supposed to be the following. I have ever worked it out, I can't remember it. I'm sure it's not difficult. <laughs> but you will explain to it out, but okay. Um, um, <coughs> it's pretty complicated. It's, it's the following. It says that, remember this was, yeah. So, once again, of course, you have del z, z prime now, squared, and t of z prime is equal to t of z to the minus c by 12 times this funny object z prime z where z prime z uh, well, f of z f times z is equal to 2 del cube f del f minus 3 del square f del square f divided by 2 del f double x. Alright, something I did check uh, is that if you plug this in for f is equal to uh, you know the z plus infinitesimal and you work it out the first order, it agrees with one. Yeah? Okay? The problem is integrated to a finite expression. Okay? Anyway. So, anyway, the, if you take this expression, the claim is that when you integrate this to a finite transformation, this is what you get. Okay? So, this is how the stress tensor transforms under the formal transformations. It transforms like a, a primary operator plus a shift in its zero part in its constant part. And the shift in this constant part is given by this expression. Okay, very good. So, uh, that's all I wanted to say about transformation properties of operators under the common transformations. We come back to this at some middle part of this lecture. We come back to this at some middle part of this lecture. But before we continue now, I'm now going to introduce to you a particular conformal transformation that is of particular use in the study of conformal operators. Okay. So, let us, this is. Okay. You remember that when we were studying string theory, when we, the, the whole discussion of conformity theory started because we were studying string theory. And when we were studying string theory, we were studying on a cylinder. Right? We had a variable sigma that went from uh, 0 to 2 pi, and we had a variable tau that went up there. Okay, now I should get my notation. Okay, now let's define a variable w. 
uh, we're working in Euclidean space now, unlike the, the discussion that we had in string theory, which was in Minkowski space. Yeah, it's a metric of sigma and tau is equal to the And let's define a variable uh, double view. So Fuchinsky calls this guy sigma 2, so let me see. Sigma 1 is sigma 2. Okay, let's define a variable double view, which is sigma 1 plus i and c. This is a complex variable that parametrizes where you are on the synth. Okay, now what I'm going to do is study a particularly interesting conformal transformation of the cylinder. And the, the tra conformal transformation of, uh, of interest to me is to a variable z, which is e to the power minus i times z. Okay, so I define a variable z, which is e to the power minus i times z. Now, the first thing that we know is that the variable W is not defined over the whole complex plane. Because sigma 1 is equal to sigma 1 plus 2 pi. So any, if all the action that's happening in the W complex plane is happening between 0 and 2 pi in this complex plane. However, when W goes to W plus 2 pi, Z comes back to itself automatically. What sigma 1 is for the variable z is the phase of z. So the fact that sigma 1 went from 0 to 2 pi in the complex variable z is no restriction. That will restrict the region over, of the complex plane over which z is. Okay, so we've, so, so we've already seen, we've already begun to understand what z is in terms of w. The phase of z is where you are on the circle. What about the radial position? Okay? The radial position in Z is, well, let's look at it. There's a minus i here, a minus i here, and a plus i here. So the radius, so we see that mod Z is equal to e to the power sigma 2. Sigma 2 was time on us. So when time goes to positive infinity, the radius goes to infinity. When time goes to negative infinity, the radius goes to zero. Okay? So we, we, we've understood what's, what's going on. We've got this W plane here, and we've got this Z plane here. Lines of constant W map to circles of constant modulus of Z in the Z plane. And as you go higher up, these circles become larger. went down to t equals minus infinity, the circle would become extremely small. If you went up to t equals plus infinity, the circle would become extremely large. Is this here? Okay? So this is a conformal map of the cylinder to the complex plane. And this is often an extremely useful thing. Okay? It's often an extremely useful thing to do um, for many reasons. Firstly, you understand that there is a sense in which if you know everything about the theory on the plane, you also know everything about the theory on the cylinder. Because these two theories are conformally related, because this, this theory is a conformal theory, and uh, the map from cylinder to the plane is a conformal one. Okay? So, uh, you don't have to separately understand the theory of the cylinder and the plane, you can do what you want. Secondly, for, from the point of view of complex analysis, the plane is a much simpler surface. Okay, because, or because you don't have you don't have to worry about eigenvalues. So it's often simpler if you're trying to use the techniques of complex analysis, which we will use a lot as we go on, to perform this map map and work on the plane. Okay, and thirdly, there's a physical thing that we will come to very soon, that we will come to very soon, that makes this, this map very really continue. Okay, so this is a particular conformal transformation. This is a particular conformal transformation that will be of great interest to us. Okay. Now let us immediately work out what the change of the stress tensor is. What the change of the stress tensor is. Um, under this map. Okay, if you want to work out how uh, oh. okay, first let's work out how 
uh, let's work out how a primary operator of weight h would transform. Okay? So a primary operator of, of weight h, remember we had which way does it go? Uh, yeah, we have that up here. So del z of z prime squared t of z prime is equal to t of z. Uh, let's call this O. Okay? So let's choose z prime, uh, well, the one that's differentiated. So let's choose z equals w, z prime equals z. And remember that z was equal to e to the power minus i. Okay? So del z over del z prime, sorry, del uh, z over del w, which is the, which is this object here, is equal to minus i times z. <coughs> Differentiated. Okay, so this this relationship becomes remember z prime of z, so uh, minus i times z OP squared, or well, let's call this h, it's an arbitrary operator h, minus i times z to the power h of O of z prime to z is equal to O of w. Okay, 
So the stress tensor, we're going to get the same relationship. So we're going to get T of, well, let's write it as T of W is equal to, in the case of stress tensor, H is 2. So that's minus Z squared T of Z. Okay? Plus some constant, which you can work out by working this thing out on the exponential map. Okay? I'm not just, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do it, I'm going to go through the result, which is, okay, it's C by N. with the 
boundary conditions that at time t1, we have a particular value of the function x of z. Okay? So let me call, denote that by taking x of sigma 1 here. At time t1, at t1, x of sigma is frozen to some particular. At time t2, we, we freeze it to some other value. Let's call it y of sigma. This path integral is now completely verified. It wasn't verified without the boundary conditions. With the, with the boundary conditions, it's now completely verified. So this is some functional which depends on x of sigma and y of sigma. And then in order to get the path into, uh, to get the attraction amplitude in question, what do we do? We take this functional and we integrate it against psi 1 of x of sigma 1 of sigma and psi 2 star of y. And then do the integral over all values of of x of sigma and y. Okay? This quantity is the path integral expression of the transition amplitude between state psi 1, state psi 2, with operators in Okay? Is this clear? I mean, uh, if quantum mechanics has had the familiar analog of the path integral where you demand that the initial particle is at x1 and the final particle is at x2, is the transition amplitude for a particle from point x1 to point x2. But of course, if you've got some wave function, you have to convolve that amplitude with the wave function. Okay, so you take that thing with fixed amplitudes and convolve it against the wave function, the two wave functions, and that's what we're doing. If you want to transition the amplitude, but you know what I mean, right? I mean, the path integral gave you x1 e to the power ih minus ih t x2. But if you were interested in psi1 and psi2, what you, well, let's call this 1 and 2. Okay, what you would do is to say that if I was interested in psi 1 e to the power minus i h d psi 2, I can then insert a complete set of states there huh? and get psi 2 uh, x2 x2 e to the power minus i h d x1 x1 psi 1 d x1 dx2. This quantity is the complex conjugate of the wave function. The final wave function, this complex quantity is the wave function. And these two integrals are these integrals of d x sigma d y sigma. Right? So if you were interested in computing some state to state transition amplitude with some operator insertions, this is the path integral you'd be doing. This is clear, right, everyone? Okay. Now, the next little question that I want to ask is, suppose I was interested in calculating a state-to-state -state transition amplitude, and I chose my states to be eigenstates of the Hamilton. Actually, because we want everything to be nice and complex, let me choose it to be eigenstates of both the Hamiltonian and the angular momentum. Okay? So suppose I choose my initial state, for instance, I'll do the same for the final state. But suppose for concreteness, I choose my initial state, okay, to be uh, an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian and the angular momentum operator, and therefore L0 and L0 bar, the way we've been talking about. Okay, so this, this, this linear combination of uh, uh, left and right. Zero volts of TV. Okay. Now, the, the next question I want to ask is: Suppose I do this path integral and I compare it to this path integral, where at the same okay. final state, same operator insertions, but I, I put in a state at an earlier time. Okay. If I wanted to get the same answer for the path integral. What should the state of the earlier time be? Okay? Now the answer to that question 
is clear. Because the path of integral just generates that evolution. Okay? So if you start with that state, which if evolved would have reached this state, and then do the path of integral over this initial region, you get the same answer for the path. say that what we will have to do is that which is to say that if we started with a state psi it was e to the power minus i h t of psi naught and we inserted this state at time t we will always get the same path in time is this here? So if we did the path integral with, um, with convolution with that state at time t, at any time t, the final answer would be the same. Okay, now all this was true in Minkowski space. We're doing our calculations in Euclidean space. Okay, you know that when you make the transition from Euclidean to Minkow Minkowski to Euclidean space, the time evolution operator becomes e to the power minus h. Okay, so in Euclidean space, if you wanted to get the same answer, if you wanted to get the same answer for the path integral, uh, if you if you had a state that was like its state of the angle, yeah, and you wanted to get the same answer for the path integral, if you made the insertion at different times, you should start with the state Euclidean. <laughs> that varies depending on your time of insertion. Like e to the power minus h, uh, hd, that's our fixed state. Okay, if the state was also, you know, um, was also a form, but was also a good eigenstate of angular momentum, was also a good eigenstate of angular momentum, had a particular uh, eigenvalue under, eigen, uh, under angular momentum. We could say not just how the state varies with time, but also how the state varies with sigma. Because any eigenstate of angular momentum uh, of eigenvalue L behave, is a function of where you are in the, on the circle, like e to the power i L sigma. Okay? So suppose we put in that condition as well. You know, we've got a psi which is e to the power minus h d plus i L sigma. Uh, sigma. Sigma. And let's call the sigma 2. What? What are we acting this for? Yeah, this is just okay. What? Well, this is on some some fixed state. Uh, what I mean is that suppose I wanted to look at what the state became if I chose if I change my zero mode of what signal. Uh, yeah. Okay. If this is confusing. Let's forget. It's not. It's not important. Okay. Let's just deal with the time. This at least is clear. Okay. Now, what I want to do now is to understand what all the statements that we've been making translate to in the same way. Okay. So the first statement translates to something very simple. <coughs> If I wanted to uh, do a path integral with various operator insertions between one time and another, what I have to do with the z plane is a path integral with various operator insertions between one radius and another. What operator insertions? Well, whatever operator you get, taking the operator that you started with and performing the conformal transformation. Okay? What states? Well, the same states. States, states, functions of, you know, size, function of where you are. It's just that the states become boundary conditions in the path integral, not in time, but in radius. Is this clear? Okay, fine, so far so good. Now, suppose I wanted to do the following. Suppose I have this path integral and I want to ask the analog of the second question we asked. That is, what path integral can I do when I change this state to be defined on at earlier times in the cylinder? 
a cylinder picture, which means a smaller radii in this area. What state do I have to define in order to achieve this? Well, I know the answer. It's this e to the power minus h sigma 2 uh, on that state, which just translates to 1 over um, uh, uh, 1 over mod z to the power h. Right? Because uh, we had uh, mod z was e to the power sigma. Remember, mod z became very large and sigma too large. Mod z was small, but sigma too small. Okay? Uh, we soon get to answer your question, Ruthi Michael. What's the interpretation of the singularity of the end? Okay. But, but you see, that as long as we don't go all the way down to z, you know, we make z any, any non zero value, whatever it is. So we have a well defined path integral that would give us the same answer as the path, the path integral that was of interest to us. In this scenario, also we are still considering states at different levels of power, right? The states at different values of power. We are considering wave functions. We are considering wave functions, but how do we have to scale the wave function as we change this radius yeah. in order to get the same answer is totally well defined. Right? If you take the path integral with one wave function here, with mod z to the power h times the same wave function. Remember, h is just a number because we're dealing with eigenstates states. We didn't need to, but let's let's say for simplicity. Okay? So it's just some if the if the energy was something, we mod z to the power of that thing. Okay. Yeah, this is H2 transform. H2 transform. So it would be the duh and the of of scale interruption. It would be whatever this H was under transformations. For example, there would be a C value. There would be the C value. It would not be the same amount of Yeah. So it would pick up that extra fact. You're, you're completely right. Okay. Now, the great thing about the Z plane is that there's no. Suppose I wanted to do such a path integral, I could make Z to be as small as I wanted. This corresponds to going T equals minus infinity in the same dimension. In that case, what does that pick up? This becomes an arbitrarily small insertion. A wave function inserted at an arbitrarily small and an arbitrarily small uh, small little circle. But that is the same thing as a local operator insertion. What do I mean by this? What is a local operator insertion in a path thing? A local operator insertion is simply a weight associated with the path integral that depends only on the value of the fields at that point and in its neighborhood. Right? On the other hand, a wave function is pretty different. Apparently, certainly in cylinders are very different. Because it depends on the value of x everywhere on a finite region. Okay? But if you take this t to infinity, you say, what we're doing is weighting this path integral by what x is doing, by x of sigma, by what x is doing only in the neighborhood of a particular point, namely the origin. Okay? And therefore, in the limit that z goes to zero, this object, whatever it is, is some local operator. Is this clear? So when we were uh, talking about the uh, idea when uh, we were in fact t equals to minus infinity. Yes. So this uh, circle had a magnet radius. Right. Then uh, then basically we are talking about the same path integral that we have given here, but evaluated on that thing, right? Yes. Uh, with the initial and final uh, shines. Yes. Now am I correct in thinking that uh, as you are taking uh, that thing, uh, one of the wave functions out there that just becomes one of the operators in operator. Exactly, exactly. That's complete. You see, the wave function, what is a wave function? It tells you do the path integral with particular boundary condition, boundary conditions on the circle, and give it different 
and give that path integral different weights depending on what these boundary conditions are. Now, the place where you're putting the wave function is shrinking to zero. So what you're doing is doing the path integral with different weights depending on what your field is like in the neighborhood of zero. But this is exactly an optic insertion. Any function that weights the path integral, any, any weight to the path integral that depends only on the field is in the neighborhood of a given point, this is opening up. You get a state. Oh, we, we, we can't do that. We, we get, you get a state. That, that. We, we talk about the reverse. Sir, but, but, a particular point is not to a particular point there. I don't understand. Is that a, say, a second? Okay. Uh, okay. I can understand that the circle at t equal to minus infinity right. is, is, is not to you know, a point. Okay. It, 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 okay. So, but. Uh, but if we started with that point, so Wait, which point? This point? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's say let's say I insert an operator at 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 some point. Yes. Okay. Uh, if it, which is not zero, you ask. Which is not zero, let's say. Yes. Then then it doesn't. I mean, that, I mean, it doesn't become wave function because it remains an operator insertion. Uh, and that, that, that's correct. But what we what we're doing is establishing a map between operators and wave functions. Okay. What, what, what I'm going to do is what, what, what the process that I've given you does is given an operator, given a wave function, it defines a local operator. Once you've got the definition of the local operator, you can insert it anyway. You see, because what is a local operator? It's some function of fields locally at that point. Once you know what an operator is, you can insert it wherever you want. With, by the same function, not a fields at that point, but at some other point. Yeah, but what I'm worried about is at, at, at when equal to zero, this, this mapping is not one one. There's the whole circle is not to a point. So okay, that, that's why, why why this good stuff is happening. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, if you know, suppose suppose is that what's, what's being defined is a singular. You see, because what, what, we're doing a path integral over the whole space. So, so the generic wave function if you put it at t equal to minus infinity. Uh -huh. okay. I mean, when, when I map it, I, I will get something which depends on which... Which direction you're going in and so on. Okay. But you see, we're also waiting by something singular. Okay? And you know that the net effect is not singular. Because the answer to this process is the same thing as doing it here, which is clearly well defined. You see, so if your worry is that by this process we are defining an operator that is singular, that can't be. Because its correlations are well defined. Its correlation functions are well defined. Are we using any property of asymptotic states that we make the statement that that's equal to minus infinity you know, there's some free state? No, no, we're never using nothing. In general, the book, you know, it's conformal field theory. It's not going to happen. Um, we will, you know, in a subsequent lecture for the case of free bosons, work this out explicitly. Okay? Some of your worry, I think, will evaporate. Because you'll see how it works. Okay? Uh, maybe I should do that. Well, no, let's not. Let's, let's leave that for when we get to the field. Okay, you, uh, for instance, we'll show that waiting by the operator del x to the power n is the same thing that, that that's the way we said it, is that if you act with the first oscillator excited any times. You take that state. And you do the procedure that I've about, we show explicitly that what this is is the same thing as meeting the path of like right? del x, del to the power of x. Okay? Uh, 
Okay, it's totally not simple. I think some of your wife will laugh at that. All your questions would arise in this context. You'll see how. Okay, uh, but even from the point of view of general logic, I think the argument is totally solid. Modular subtleties about things like normalizability of the states. You know, you must start with well-defined states if you want to. You, you, you want to uh, uh, you want to go through this, this argument. I'm going to tell you about the reverse thing in a moment. It's so obvious, but uh, you are always have to work. The, uh, there will be a formal argument that if you insert an operator, you can always produce a state. What we've done is understand how to go from state to an operator. There's a reverse argument of how you can get a state from an operator. But you always have to worry about you know whether you need something formal. You know, you've got some state that doesn't like Hilbert space because it's not normal. Those things are always possible, uh, and you have to be careful when it's But modular that, I think the argument is totally solid. Okay, so what is the what have the argument done? Just just to get that made here, yeah? what we have found is a map from states to operators in a states to local operators. Moreover, there is an obvious reverse, and that's this. Suppose I take the path integral of the z plane, okay? I insert the operator of the origin, and I do the path integral subject to boundary conditions that x or sigma is something. The answer to the path integral will depend on what x or sigma is. Therefore, we have a functional of x or sigma. That functional is a wave function. And it's clearly the reverse process of whatever. It is the wave functional, which, if I operated the state operator map on, could have given you this operator. Right? Because, is that clear? Suppose you had some wave function psi, psi of x, and then you acted by the wave function by x1 over mod z to the power h, you brought it down here, you got some operator. What are the property of that operator? By construction, suppose there are no operator, no other operator exceptions. Okay? And I choose this to be mod z equals 1. For specific things, I chose this here. By definition, it is that operator is that operator which, when inserted and with no other operators, if I do the path integral, produces the state. That's how you define that operator, right? Is this clear? Therefore, there's a clear reverse map. Uh, this operator which actually corresponds to the state at minus at equals to minus infinity. Or right. it depends on the state uh, shy at uh, you know. I mean at this because you're trying to go to that state. Yeah, but let's 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 look at the logic. What I've done is to show you that if you start with the state, you can get an operator. Now suppose we forget about this. Given an operator, but you know nothing else about, you don't know how it's come from the state. Given an operator, I want to ask. What state had I done this operation to would have given me this operator? Okay? The answer to that question is clear. All you have to do is to do the path integral with the insertion of that operator at the origin. That path integral will give you a wave function. How does it give you a wave function? But the answer to the path integral depends on what your values of your fields are on the circle. That's the wave function. What does this is this operator is really uh, related to some kind of creation of paper? But any component that it, it, it is the you see it is the set of operators of the theory. Now uh, um, you know for instance in in the theory of the free scalar field these operators will be operators like del x, del squared x, all the local local operators of the theory. So they're not the creation operators. Because they're local. They're not the uh, creation operators of particles in the theory. Which are not. But they won't be local in the, in the sigma 1 and sigma 2. No, they're local always, you see. Because what is an operator? It's a local weighting of the path integral. Okay. So no matter which variables you're looking at, local is local. Right, but that corresponded to some uh, circuit. Uh, 
in the uh, in the cylinder uh, picture. Okay. So you see, what we've done is define a map from a state to an operator. Once we've got that operator, you know that operator is now just a well-defined operator. Okay. So which you can then insert on the cylinder any way you want. So we can just do the reverse continuous transmission back on the operator to go to the cylinder and we can use that operator. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's correct. You've got the operator. Now there is some function of x. You know, reverse transform that back into. Wait, if you wanted to work the cylinder. That's perfectly right. Okay. So. But what would that mean for the. Uh, for this and, uh, so what we are doing with this state? If your question is how we are going to use this, let's wait for the use it. As long as you agree with every statement. Okay? And the statements are, and let me repeat this, there is a one-to-one -one map between the local operators of the theory and state. Okay? In fact, in a way, well, yeah. Modular problems with normalizing. You know, the second map is not so clear because it could give you a non normalizing mistake. It sometimes happens in non compact topology things. Not in the things we can deal with. This formula means that we'll get. Modular possible stuff at least we've established a one to one map between operators in theory, local operators in the theory, and states. Okay, now I first want you to see how surprising this is. See, because in quantum mechanics, a state is a column and operators are matrix. There are many more matrices than columns. Number of matrices square is the number of number of columns. How can there be a map between number of operators and between states and operators? See, it's clear you can get starting with any operator, you can get a state. Act on that state. Act on that action with that operator. Exactly. It's your state. That's a nice canonical map, and that's essentially what we're talking about. Why? It's because you see. Uh, there are a lot of avoiding uh, one. Yeah, but 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 even so, I mean, there are enough that don't. It's it's not you know. Um, but okay, so for instance, then that would establish that one to one. Because you add to the operator any operator that annihilates the vacuum, which you give in sense to it. Okay? So you, your, your, your point is basically sharpening the process. The point here is that it's not a local, it's not a map between all operators of the theory and states. It's only a map between local operators and states. Had it been a statement of a map between operators and states, it would just be manifest contradiction. Can't be true. This is a claim to be a map between local operators and states. Okay? It's not true in every field theory. It is true in conformity theories. In fact, it's true in conformity theories in every dimension for more or less the same reasons. This conformal map between the equivalent of a cylinder and a plane goes through more or less uniformity. Uh, though we were, we we're interested in that, in that at the moment. Uh, uh, two dimensions. Which Anthony has written a paper about how this works in higher dimensions. You can ask him about it. Okay. Um, uh, very good. So, uh, Jyotin, on your question. Your question was, uh, your question was, um, wh why is why is this thing essentially acting with the operator on, on, the, on the vacuum? Well, you see, um, suppose you do a path integral. Okay? Suppose you do a path integral and uh, uh, um, Actually, it's, it's a little, little more subtle. It's a little more subtle. It's actually act the lowest energy state that survives when you act the operator. Okay, but let's, let, 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 let me say this thing. Okay, suppose you do a path integral and let the cylinder thing go to infinity. Okay. In Minkowski space, depending on what boundary conditions you put here, you could have any state. In any space, you could have any state you want properly. But if you're doing this in Euclidean space, then no matter what boundary conditions you put down below, 
as long as the boundary condition is, is not so funny that it projects out the vacuum, if you put the boundary condition far enough below, the only thing that survives at late enough time is a vacuum. Because the propagation operator is e to the power minus h. Okay? So if you do a Euclidean path integral, you allow this path integral to go down to times t equals minus infinity. What, what you're doing is uh, 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 what you're doing is uh, uh, starting with the vacuum and then getting whatever you need. Okay? Now what we're doing in order to get our state is acting with so we've got the disk, which is the whole of this, which is the analog and cylinder that went all the way down to minus infinity. And then we're acting on that with some operator. Because the cylinder went all the way down to minus infinity, it's vacuum state that we're acting on with an operator. And then you tie it off, and that's the state. Take this picture and transform it, tra translate it in some sense. Well, it's hard to do because that's, that thing's a singular point. Okay? I think this is more or less precise. Okay? So, but the, the operation and definition we will always use is the path integral. So, the, uh, uh, the corresponding the corresponding operator for the vacuum is. The uh, in some theories, it's, in all unitary theories, it's the identity. Wait. Because, no, I, how can it be something else? In the but this is the logic that you gave right now. Uh -huh. So, operator acting on vacuum, uh, I mean, uh, the vacuum is also an operator, right? Right, right. right. Then, uh, if we want to look at that operator at this point, right. So, there has to be the vacuum at that point also. Right. I mean, which we are acting. Right, on. right, 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 right. So so that's, that's unless that's something that's funny intervenes to spoil that logic, what you're saying will be true. And it will basically be genetically true that what you're saying is totally right. There will be funny theories in which something spoils what you just said, which we'll discuss when we get to these funny theories. But basically, if you were interested in unity of property theory where everything is nice, what you said is exactly right. Okay? The, uh, we'll come to caveats when we, when we get to that, but basically, you're right. Yeah. Uh, you see, the thing I said was not totally. Okay. Okay. Let's 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 get back. You're essentially right, but not always. And we come come back to that with me. But it's a good comment. It's it's good intuition. It's correct intuition. Most of the okay. Good. Any other questions or comments uh, about this before we proceed? I know this is a very subtle idea. And it took me as a student a very long time to understand it. Uh, I think the technology of explaining it has, in, has improved. <laughs> Basically, because Bochinsky wrote his book in the uh, 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 But you know, the explanations pre Bochinsky's book made absolutely no sense at all. Just okay. But uh, this, this is the language in which I think it is best, easiest to understand. To my taste. Many other ways of saying it. Many people have said it in many uh, strange subjects. Okay. Um, fine. Now, okay, all that's very nice. Now we want to use this fact. Okay? I want to use this fact in order to do two things. Okay, we've gone much slower in this class than I hope to. But, but it's okay, you have to get the ideas. Okay. Um, I want to use this fact in two ways. Let me first use it in a calculation of okay? And then next use it. In a conception. Oh, maybe I'll do the conception again first. Since you'll get less time, we won't run with that. And then the calculation. First, the conception thing. I want to expect, I want to understand the operator product expansion in quantum field theory. Okay? Using the state operator map, it's totally trivial. Okay. So let me now make a clean statement of what the operator product is. Okay. So, suppose I have two operators, let's say O1 and O2. And I want to expand this product in a power series expansion of operators at the point O. Okay. Then, the statement of the operator product expansion says, in the case of conformity theory with respect, yes. Draw a circle around O1 whose radius is which passes through O2. Provided 
There are no other operators inserted within the circle. There could be anything you want inside that circle. Okay? But provided there are no other operators inserted within the circle. Okay? Then this product of operators can be replaced by by uh, so let's call this okay, let's call this O I O J. Some C I J K O K inserted at let's call this Z1, let's call this Z2. At Z2. And this 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 replacement gives you the same answer for the path integral, no matter what other insertions you perform in, in there. That's the claim. Is the claim of the operator product expansion is the statement clear? Okay? That insertion of this operator and this operator can be replaced by an infinite sum of insertions only at the point Z2 of different local operators. Okay? The coefficients of this expansion are independent of what insertions happen on the side. Of course, for any given insertion, you know, it's not so surprising that you can do this. So I'll take an expansion of the answer. Right? Because the answer depends on Z1 depends on Z2. So you could take the take the answer that depends on Z2 minus Z1 and take the next one. The key point is that it's independent of what these other insertions are. And we're given them to four Is this is this clear? Okay? Hey, uh, uh, you know, if, if just in order to see how we understood the statement is in general quantum field theory reasoning, you can read a Weinberg's explanation of it in his book on quantum field theory. I, I never quite understood it, but maybe, you know, it's some complicated explanation. No doubt it's correct. But uh, uh, just see how simple the explanation will be. Okay. What's the act? What's, 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 uh, what's the act? Well, you see, Doing the insertion with this operator insertion and this operator insertion, we can do the path integral to some radius just outside O2. That path integral is a well defined path integral which depends on the boundary condition of x of sigma on this radius just outside O2 and therefore defines some state. Okay? By the state operator map, this is the same thing. I should have drawn a better picture. Let me let me draw the pictures there. Okay, so I started. So let me just for simplicity, it's not essentially the argument at all, it's translation made. But for simplicity, I'll put this first guy at the origin. But I call the origin also totally arbitrary, it's up to me. Okay, so. Okay, so I've got an operator here, this is O1, I've got some operator O2. And I've got uh, uh, other operators outside here. And let me draw my circle. Main point is that I can always, because of the condition, I can always circle the operator O1 with the circle that lies outside both O1 and O2 and the place no one Okay? So, I can do the path integral now including, so the, what I want for this correlation function is the whole path integral. But I can break the path, path integral into two parts. The path integral over fields here and the path integral over field here. There are also path integrals over field here. So, three parts. But that third path is just doing it in is just integrating over fields of the wave function. So doing the path integral in the interior of the disk computes the wave function. And then doing the path integral outside is it, the other path integral weighted by that wave function. Okay? So this thing gives me some wave function with knowing which I, I can completely do the path integral that I have of interest. 
But that base function is, by the state operator map, the same thing as some operator, I don't know which, but some operator, let me call that operator matrix, this, this green dot, in here, with nothing here in the disk, and these operators. What this operator is depends only on what this big function was, which depends only on, on, on what O1 and O2 was. Okay? So that gives me a, a map between uh, between uh, uh, between uh, th that has replaced the insertion of these two operators with the insertion of a single operator, and which operator it is depended only on the on what O1 and O2 was, and not on what the other other insertions in the a, a in the market table. Moreover, if I choose to expand my operators in a basis of, of operators that were dual to eigenstates of the Hamilton, which we will the convention we adopt uh, momentarily. Okay, then from the fact that any good state you know, can be expanded in a convergent fashion in eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, you can even argue for stronger properties of this operator product expansion. You can argue for convergence problem. That's not just some asymptotic pattern, actually convergent and so on. Okay, that's not only the What? This is only true for conformal. This is true only for these 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 things. Right. So you can argue for rather, you know, I mean strong properties of this operator product expansion basically by replacing it about statements about expansions of states in a basis in okay? So using the state operator map that's what that's what the operator product expansion maps to. Okay? So this is the first thing. It's very subtle argument, it's not even very subtle. All the subtleties land the operator, state operator map. Once you've accepted that, the statement of the, oper the operator product expansion is really clear. Okay, so if you understood this, then you know what I mean. I've been making these statements like t of z o of zero is equal to blah 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 blah. I've been making these statements, not quite saying what I mean. This is what I mean. This is no, no, of course. Okay, when I make such a statement, I mean it, make it in the sense of the operator product expansion, and the operator product expansion is is, is true, not in some fuzzy sense. But by derivative, but you know, we can derive in a two dimensional field, right? In, in the strongest sense possible. No, in a higher dimension, the formal set is very simple. It's, it's the conformal invariance. Basically, what's important is the state operator. Right. Okay? So that exists for higher That exists for higher See, basically, what was important is that you take finite steps as things and shrink it to a point using the Once you can do that, you have your state. Oh, you can ask Anthony about it. She's the big one. Okay. Uh, okay. Other questions, comments? Fine. Now, other statements that we used last class that we want to justify. Last class, we talked about how it was always possible to choose a basis in the state of operators that were eigenstates that are definite eigenvalue on the scaling dimension and rotation. Using the state operator map, what is the statement map? You remember the last class, we, we worked with these particular operators which were quasi primary. Quasi primary operators have definite scale, scale dimension and definite rotational properties. But under the state operator map, in scale dimension goes to energy. I should have said this more clearly. I should have said this more clearly. You see, um, what is the generator of time translations on the cylinder? What does it map to on the z-plane? See, time is a radius in the <laughs> More precisely, radius is e to the power time. Okay? So d by dt is r d by dr. Okay? Which is the same thing as x mu d by dx. It's a generator of scale transformations on the z-plane. 
So the handle term of the cylinder maps to the generator scale transformations okay, of the set plane. Okay? Uh, so, uh, um, so, 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 we were dealing with operators with given values of scale trans of, of scale, scale dimension and rotation. What does this map to about a statement of states? It maps to the statement that given any state in the limit space, it is possible to expand it in a basis of, of state of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and the angular moment, which is a manifestly true statement about any any quantum mechanical system in which the Hamiltonian and angular moment. Okay? So the possibility of choosing a basis in the space of operators which have good scaling dimension and good rotational properties. In this thing, it's not you know, some heuristic thing, it's just true. It follows from some statement we're very familiar with about inverse spaces. Using the state operator map. Once again, we see the power of the state operator map. Opera operators are such a large, untamed class of objects. States are much simpler. The local operators are the same as states in these things. Okay, so any statement about operators becomes Simpler, easier to understand. So, what does the state correspond to T? To, uh, to, 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 to T? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll see. Um, it's. You see, it, it will essentially be. But it, it will depend on the theory. Okay? In, in the theory of the free boson, there will be bilinear in, uh, in creation of data. So, if you something on special. Because D is a very special operator in the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's well, I mean yeah, no, you're, you're, you're right, you're right, you're right. In representation theory it's very special state. Um, you see, uh, the best way to say it is this. I'll say the words that we can understand better as we go on. But all states of the theory can be arranged in uh, representations of the conformal group. Representation of the conformal group are labeled by primary operators. There is one very special operator, namely the identity operator, which is a primary. The operator corresponding to uh, the state corresponding to the operator T is a is a particular descendant of the identity operator. So it lies in the module generated by the identity in a very particular way. Okay, so from the point of view of representation theory of the data sort of algebra, it is of course very special. Uh, what it looks like in terms of some other description, you know, some photons of the theory, and so on, will depend on the theory. A special theory will see what we get. Okay? But from the point of view of representation theory, it's very special. It's a new uh, okay. All that, much of this is coming. Uh, good. Other questions, comments? Fine. Okay. Uh, so we want to uh, the state operator map. We want to why we can always choose state things in, in some in some basis. Uh, let me, oh well. Now let me quickly before we end this class, let me quickly use. Sorry. Yes. So what's the result of this state of the state corresponding to the identity of this basis? Okay, we're going to study this representation theory in a little bit. Let's let's hang on. Let's. I mean, the basic point is that you generate states by the action of uh, T on the primary operator. But how do you get the operator T? Well, you get by acting on T on the primary operator, which is the identity, because that's T. That, that's the basic point. It's, uh, uh, we'll get to it in, in, in more detail. Hmm. Okay. Um, fine. So, uh, um, now what I, what I want to do is to use these ideas to understand the Vila sort of energy. Okay. So, you see, the main point of this lecture as compared to the last lecture was to try to understand things now in terms of states and Hilbert spaces and so on. To understand, you know, usually quantum field theories are path integrals, but they're not only path integrals. They also have this nice Hilbert space, space structure in them. And it's the interplay between these two structures that often gives you the most interesting things in the theory. Okay? So, 
you know that because we had this nice uh, Vinasolo algorithm. I mean, we had this nice TT operator property. T of Z, T of W, is equal to T by 2 over Z minus W over 4 plus T of W over W over squared plus del T of W over Z minus Okay. Now, <coughs> uh, two. Now, the real, I mean, we said that these things are function only of Z and W because we derive them inside the path integral. The variation of all uh, correlation functions as we move the point of insertion is holomorphic. These objects. Okay, so let me do the following. Let me make the following definition. Okay, um, I'll define T of Z is equal to sum over n equals minus infinity to infinity, ln divided by z. <laughs> what this uh, uh, what this what the statement means is always be understood inside inside a path. You know, we can compute correlation functions of t for every value of z. We know it's holomorphic, so that correlation function is, is you know we define a new operator L defined by this by this equation. That is, you compute a correlation function. If you want to compute a correlation function of t of L, what you do is compute the correlation function of t. And isolate the dependence on z it goes like one over z by n plus two. What is it not true over the correlation? Well, it, it is. It is. It, 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 it's just a Fourier term. It's, it's true. It's true. It's, it's true outside the correlation. It could be a statement about a Heisenberg operator uh, uh, evolving in, in time. Uh, it's it's completely true. Uh, fine. That's that's true. But uh, we will only use it, you know. <laughs> If you know new correlation functions, you could come here. You do what? Fine. It's only true within correlation functions. Okay. Now, so what, what do I mean more precisely? Suppose I want to compute something involving it. Okay. If I know everything about the correlation function of T's, how do I get a correlation function of L's? Well, that's very simple. What I do is suppose I want a correlation function involving an L acting at some uh, particular time. Uh, the time might be important because this analyticity is only true if there are no operator insertions. You know, this, 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 this analytic behavior of T, uh, uh, that T is an analytic function, is true providing you're not sitting on some other operator. Okay? So suppose you've got some operator here and some operator here, then the dependence of uh, 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 of t in this region is given by my analytic expression. 